I'm joined now by the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. Thanks so much for taking the time. Good to see you. So I guess this is, uh, insofar as two years can be a tradition, this is our <laughs> tradition That's now right. in our post-State of the Union wrap-up. So let's let's get the bad stuff out of the way first. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene entered the chamber decked out in full Donald Trump regalia. What was your reaction to seeing that on a night like last night? Yeah, I noticed it when we were coming in. And uh, look, politics is always in the air at these things. But I don't think I've ever seen somebody in campaign apparel or with you know campaign signage uh, at a State of the Union address. I don't know what the rules are for members of Congress. Uh, that you know that's for them to figure out. Uh, but uh, look, I, I think it just emphasized that the the extreme politics of some House members uh, and teed up the president to uh, give a message that, you know, while he was very uh, straightforward, even aggressive about the contrast, at the same time, what he laid out was something that most Americans agree with on issue after issue after issue. And I think, uh, you know, some of those antics just bring that into relief even more strongly. There was reporting that Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, had called for decorum prior to the, to, to the night happening, which I guess was a little bit of a fool's errand when you run the Republican House conference, but there were interruptions nonetheless. Yeah. So what was the feeling like in the room? Was there, was there a, and this, this has now become like a regular phenomenon. Was there a sense of like exhaustion with it from within the room? You know, it's happened often enough that I think when you're in the room, you're always kind of waiting for it or ready for it. But part of what we saw is none of that shook the president. And, uh, you know, all, all of that kind of goes on. There's chirping, there's chattering, there's even uh, some, some just inappropriate interjections from from the uh, the, the back benches, but uh, none of it really took away from the message that the president was there to deliver. And uh, again, I think a lot of that traces back to the fact that on issue after issue, whether it's infrastructure or whether it's woman's right to choose, what the president had to say is deeply in line with what most Americans, if not necessarily most House Republicans, already believe. With that said, there were there were fewer interruptions than yeah, so. there were in previous years. What does it say that Republicans didn't seem to test their luck in the same way that they did last year? I think they kind of learned their lesson last time, right? <laughs> it turns out for all that they say about the president, he, he's pretty quick on his feet in those yeah. moments, and it's just not going to reflect well on them. And uh, I think they most of them absorbed that lesson. Uh, you know, you, you, you did see uh, some of them, I think, at... Uh, at one point, he, he kind of tested them on what seemed to be them uh, doubling down on a commitment to tax cuts for the wealthy, for example, just in the kind of back and forth that was going on. Uh, it turns out, under President Biden, typically when that sort of thing happens, he comes out the better for it. And I think most of them realize that. Can you speak about just more broadly? I mean, you, you know what their attacks are over his age, over, uh, you know, there, there's these constant claims that he's in cognitive decline. Can you speak about, about what the State of the Union address did to kind of rebut those claims? Because a lot of those claims kind of exist and fester in yeah. in in darkness, like without yeah. the light of day, because because they don't often actually see him and, and hear from him. Right. And so, speak about what last night actually did to kind of. Uh, to kind of neutralize those claims. Yeah, I think what was most important was this. You know, a lot of us who work with him, with him have been saying, hey, this is somebody who is on top of his game, knows what he's doing, and we see that when we're in the room with him. And then there's been this weird counter discourse saying, oh, okay, how come that's only behind closed doors? And so tonight was a good chance to demonstrate, no, uh, the same person we're talking about being in the room with, uh, when there's five people in the Roosevelt room, is the person you saw in front of hundreds of people and speaking to tens of millions of people uh, in uh, from from the well of the House of, or the the rostrum at the House of the Representatives. It's it's the same person, with the same intensity, the same focus, the same strength, and the same clarity. And I'm glad he had a chance to demonstrate that last night in the speech. You know, generally Republicans stand for at least some stuff, right? They'll stand up and applaud for for the basic stuff for veteran health care, for health care for Americans, for lower costs, um, just just the, the easy stuff, the gimmies. Yeah. They didn't stand for anything. Yeah, it was kind of weird when, when he's talking about, you know, the achievement of bringing back manufacturing jobs to the Midwest, right? And you <laughs> see like Republican House members from the Midwest kind of sitting like like uh, uh, with body language that says, I don't like that. It's it's a strange thing. And I get, look, there's this political dynamics and, and you know, you decide whether to get up, whether to clap or not. Um, can't tell somebody else what to do. But but again, I think most Americans are cheering for the results. Most Americans are definitely cheering for, for the fact that uh, when you want a job, you can generally get a job in this country, that unemployment's the lowest it's been in 50 years, that we do have manufacturing coming back. I don't care if you support uh, one party or the other politically, these are good things. And I think it's good for the president, not just on his own behalf, 
but on behalf of the country, to take a bit of a victory lap on those achievements, even while he's talking about the problems we have in front of us and, and what he wants to do about them. One of those issues was uh, the border and mm. the border bill that was put forward. Do you think that, uh, that he had done an effective job then in drawing that contrast between Republicans coming out and saying constantly for years, decades, that we need some fix to the border. And when a conservative Republican, James Lankford, who, by the way, C-SPAN, their cameras went right to him while he right. was talking about it. And I think at one point he even like agreed with the president as he was speaking uh, to draw that contrast between the fact that they say they want this done and when they're actually given the opportunity to pass a bill, they don't take yes for an answer. Yeah, I think it demonstrated the most important dynamic we have here, which is that some congressional Republicans have decided that they would rather have the issue be bad so that they can beat the president up about it as a political issue, then team up with the president on a bipartisan basis to actually improve conditions. Look, the, the conditions at the border are not something that any of us are happy with. Uh, and it, maybe you'll, you'll say that our administration hasn't been perfect on that, hasn't got everything right. All the more reason that if there's a chance for a compromise and a tough compromise where you know the, the bases of both parties, ours and the other, uh, were upset with some of the compromises that it took to generate this package and yet they did it. And yeah, just to be clear, uh, you know, Senator Langford's name may not be a household name. We are talking about a very conservative <laughs> yeah. Republican who found a way to work across the aisle only for the rug to be pulled out from under him and everybody who teamed up on this. Uh, and from what we can tell, it, it came because the former president told congressional Republicans to stop cooperating, stop trying to solve the problem so that the problem could just fester. Yeah. Uh, another another moment that I that I believe was the most powerful moment of the evening was when the president directed like directed his speech dr at, right at the Supreme Court justices mm. and basically uh, basically warned about the consequences of not just Dobbs but its resulting decision of of basically banning IVF. I mean that that was the predicate for the Alabama Supreme Court decision. Uh, what was the feeling like in the room when he when he when he did that? Well, I think you could feel the president invoking what Americans believe, most Americans anyway, uh, and express uh, in, in their preferred choices, filtering through uh, to the, the, the dynamics that the court should be conscious of. The court by design is supposed to be an apolitical institution. And yet part of why regard for the court in the country has diminished is that it has come to feel more and more like it is a political institution and has made political what are viewed as political choices. Uh, and look, if it were not for President Trump keeping his promise to take away the right to choose through the court, uh, we wouldn't be worried about uh, things like access to IVF. Alabama is the first place where access to IVF was withdrawn. I do not think it will be the last. And I think the president was right to raise that these are the things that are at stake in who gets to make those decisions, whether it's in Congress, on the court, or throughout our political system. And speaking about those regular issues that impact people was a recurring theme throughout this speech. Um, what, what did it, what, I guess, what was your takeaway from the fact that, you know, while Republicans are focusing on nebulous issues, that the president was speaking, speaking about IVF and Roe, which impacts regular people, about shrinkflation, which impacts regular people, yeah. about eliminating junk fees and late charges in banks, which, again, impacts regular people? You know, I think the president's North Star has always been everyday life. Uh, you know, I actually heard some of the Republican senators sitting nearby snickering at him, no pun intended, when he was describing a bag of chips or a Snickers bar yeah. uh, being, uh, uh, you know, being shrunk by these companies that yeah. want to sell less for the same price, uh, which I think shows that actually he's the one who's more in touch. This is about everyday life. All politics is about everyday life. And frankly, my side of the aisle, God bless us, are sometimes prone to getting lost in the alphabet soup of the names of the bills and the numbers and the statistics and the policy details. Uh, so I appreciate that sometimes against the, the uh, uh, <laughs> some of the currents of our own party's rhetorical style, the president kept it down to the basics. What matters is not the, the $1.2 trillion or, or the number 46,000, which is how many projects we have going out there. It's that this project got somebody a job. That project got somebody a better bridge in their community. That someone's everyday life gets better or gets worse, depending on the decisions that are made in the White House, in the Congress, and in the courts. Well, you had just alluded to those 46,000 projects. Uh, can you speak about the material impact that those are having across the country? Because a lot of times, like, we don't, you know, it's very easy for our national news cycles to just focus on you know, the major top line bullshit of the day. Yeah. But this is this is the stuff that, to our earlier point, actually impacts people. Look, sometimes, as, as my public affairs director says, sometimes 
good news is no news. And so we have a responsibility, I think, to make sure that we do cut through the BS and talk about real things happening as a direct result of President Biden's leadership and, and those in Congress who chose to support him on things like the infrastructure bill. And what that means in small communities that are getting a, a streetscape fix that's going to help mean fewer fatal car crashes, or in some of what I call the cathedrals of our infrastructure, like uh, the I-5 bridge that I visited in Vancouver, Washington, that is 107 years old and is a vital link for people's commutes and for their supply chains uh, that is going to get fixed now, replaced actually. Um, Or the Blotnick Bridge in uh, uh, Superior, Wisconsin and Duluth, Minnesota that goes across that river, across that state line and is uh, at risk of closing within a few years if it doesn't get fixed, finally going to be fixed because we brought them a billion dollars made possible through the president's infrastructure package. And even if you're not into roads and bridges, um, it's shaping lives. We're not just building infrastructure, we're building livelihoods. I was just out in the Pacific Northwest talking about that I-5 bridge with workers and uh, talked to a a working mom who's, who's in one of the building trades saying how this project is the difference that will mean that she is able to actually see her children most nights. Uh, Another guy who is a returning veteran from Iraq and Syria, who believes he would be a statistic if he had not found the union, the sense of purpose that comes with it, and the the work opportunity that has made him now the first in his family to own a home. That's what this is about. And that's just from the process of building the project, let alone the finished product that everybody gets to actually use and benefit from. That's why we're doing all this work. Can you talk about going into these communities as it relates to like folks' partisan affiliations and what it does to see the administration in there? Because, you know, a lot of these communities, what it looks like, I mean, I've seen videos that, that have been produced as, as a result of the, of the bipartisan infrastructure law. And these don't look like, you know, liberal cities, right? These, yeah. don't, these, these, are, these are blue-collar communities, which, which to the naked eye would seem, you know, would seem like their working class communities would, would vote red. So what's it like to go to these places? Like, what's the reaction from folks? What I love is we can put into practice the saying that there's no such thing as a Republican road or a Democratic bridge. And I've been to rural communities where we meet with local officials, county officials, you know, the kinds of small towns where every mayor or county commissioner uh, has a day job as well. And I've seen some grown men with tears coming into their eyes about some of the projects that we're finally bringing to their communities. And many of them, I'm sure, are Republican. I don't know. I don't ask. It's not that important. Uh, what is important is that I want people to see that, that the work that the president has led, um, that was bipartisan often. We got many, not most, but many Republicans to cross the aisle in Congress and work with Democrats and, and the president and the cabinet to get this done that it means better life, uh, better everyday life in these communities. Red communities, blue communities, purple communities, and that's the point. I feel like Republicans very often capitalize on folks who claim that they're the forgotten Americans. What's it like to go into these communities and actually be the administration that is remembering them, even though other administrations who kind of seize on this talking yeah. point that they're remembering the forgotten Americans don't? Yeah, I think the point is that actions speak louder than words. Just a couple of days ago, I was addressing the, the national gathering of the uh, uh, UA union, that's pipeliners, plumbers, pipe fitters, steam fitters. And they were talking about the promises that were made to them under the last administration that, you know, President Trump promised you're going to get an infrastructure bill, promised he would fix their pensions, promise after promise. None of it happened, Um, which is a good example of what it means to actually be forgotten. Uh, We've been able to deliver on that. The president obviously delivered on the infrastructure bill, also a pension reform that was very important for the building trades, project labor agreements happening across the country that mean more of those jobs will be good paying, a provision called Davis-Bacon, which has to do with the wages on construction sites, those going up. So yeah, the exact same people who were being appealed to as forgotten. And look, I come from the industrial Midwest. I think a lot of us from so-called flyover country did feel forgotten by both parties for many, many years. Uh, But what's so exciting now is it's not just talk. It's it's policies, not just promises. It's it's jobs, not just generalities. And that's landing. How have you sold the importance of something that people don't realize is missing until it's gone. Like, is that, has that presented a, a difficult like issue for you? Because people don't realize that their that their roads and bridges need help until their roads and bridges need help. You know, the nature of infrastructure is most of the time you're not supposed to have to think about it. I like to think about this stuff, but the whole idea of a road that works is it just works. Uh, just like the whole importance of clean, safe drinking water coming out of your tap is that you never have to get up in the morning and spend one ounce of your energy while you're getting your kids ready for school. 
worried about whether clean, safe drinking water is going to come out of the tap. But it turns out a whole lot has to happen precisely so that you don't have to worry about that. And it's okay for that to play out in the background, except when we're making choices about the policies that are going to make or break these kinds of improvements. I think it's also true around our rights and freedoms. You know, uh, we have grown up with the assumption through most of our lifetimes that the only direction that America would go in is toward more rights and freedoms. Certainly uh, over the years, over the, over the decades, the, the eons, and certainly into my lifetime where something like my right to get married uh, is relatively new, but, but you know, secured uh, in 2015. Um, that wasn't there before, it allowed us to believe that every generation could know it's going to have more rights and freedoms than before. But part of what the president brought up last night is that when the right to choose has been taken away, as promised by, uh, by the former president and, um, and his appointees, when books are being banned in the United States of America, when IVF and actra- access to birth control are on the chopping block, it turns out a lot of rights and freedoms that we took for granted uh, are not at all secure, are not at all safe. And that's a big part of what's at stake in the conversations happening in this city right this minute. And what does that look like with a Biden administration in 2024 to 2028 versus a potential Trump administration? Well, without getting into campaigns or elections, what, what I'll say is that the president laid out a freedom agenda and uh, talked about freedom and democracy being expanded, not withdrawn. What does that mean in practical terms? It means measures like uh, codifying Roe v. Wade. Uh, the, the, the Republican appointed Supreme Court may have taken it away, uh, but Congress could act in order to uh, create and protect those rights. He talked about the Equality Act, and I appreciate him not forgetting that because that's it's still incredibly important, unfinished business uh, for the LGBTQ plus community. He talked about the Voting Rights Act, named for John, the original Voting Rights Act, but also the, uh, the John Lewis Act that would expand uh, access to the vote, which is the most important thing. Uh, it, is, it is your vote not your weaponry, that makes sure that the government works for the people and not the other way around. And he talked about how to expand that. So I think you'll see more of where that came from this year uh, and into a future Biden administration. Perfectly put. We'll leave it there. Secretary Pete, thanks for taking the time. Thank you.